Hello, my name is Bill Kinney, and this is the first of what I hope will many, be many videos about doing proofs in a real analysis. I've taught real analysis quite a number of times, and in fact, last fall, fall 2016, I videotaped my lectures for that course. You may want to go see those, those at my YouTube channel, Bill Kinney Math, and in fact, here's a card link to that playlist for those lectures. But in these videos, I want to focus on doing proofs, details of proofs. Though I am going to use some shorthand notation, for example, and not do what's ideal. Ideally, you write proofs in complete sentences, and I, but I'm not going to focus on that for the sake of time. And in this particular one, the first one, I thought it would be good to focus on the irrational, irrationality of roots, and in particular, uh, the irrationality of square roots, where n is not a perfect square. Notation-wise, what do I have here? I'm supposing I've got an n that's an natural number. This fancy n stands for the set of natural numbers. Also called z plus. z stands for Zahlen, which is a German word for numbers. z plus would be the positive integers. So I've got a uh, an element of that set that's not a perfect square. I'm going to prove that the square root of that number is irrational. It's not rational. Actually, I'm going to be a little less ambitious than I could be. I'm not going to prove that the square root of n exists. I'm going to assume it exists, actually, and prove that if it exists, then it must be not rational. It must be irrational. The proof that the square root of n exists is actually harder, um, and I'm going to save that for later. Maybe a more um, mundane way to say what I'm going to do here, a more simple way, really, to focus on assuming it exists, I'm going to say that if x squared equals n, where n is not a perfect square, let me abbreviate perfect square ps, then x is not an element of the set of rational numbers. q will stand for the set of rational numbers, q standing for quotient. All right. Here's the start of the proof. I am going to write the first sentence, the first thing out as a sentence because this is a common thing to do um, that I want to show you here. When you try to show x is not an element of a certain set, it's quite often a good strategy to assume to the contrary that it is an element of the given set and try to get some sort of logical contradiction out of the assumption. If you arrive at such a logical contradiction, that means your original assumption was wrong, and so then x must not be an element of that set. So it's kind of a funny argument, but it's really useful and pretty much is the only way to go here, I think, is a proof by contradiction. And you start such proofs typically with the following kind of sentence. Assume to the contrary, assume to the contrary that the opposite of what you want to show is true, that in this case x is an element of the set of rational numbers, the quotients. Um, that's how we're going to start off the proof that sentence right there. <clears throat> now that that's easy to write down, but where do you go from here? Sometimes you hit walls in these things and it's not clear what to do. Well, go ahead and do some scribbles on some scratch paper just to write down some things to try to do. And I hope eventually you would at least reach the conclusion that you could say then x must be a ratio a over b, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> of two integers. a and b are integers they are elements of z. Um, and in fact, since we're going to focus on positive square roots, you could even say these are positive integers. b is not 0. If I say a and b are positive integers, if I write it like this, they are in z plus, that takes care of the assumption that I'm not dividing by 0 as well. The next thing I'm going to write down is definitely not something obvious to write down. And this is definitely something that you need a little instruction on if you've never seen this kind of proof before. You want to emphasize here, it is important to assume that a over b is completely reduced. It's a fraction that is reduced as far as possible. When doing proofs in real analysis, you are going to be assuming you know facts about the integers and the rational numbers, and you don't need to reprove those things. For example, the integers forms a ring, and things like unique factorization, unique prime factorization hold in the integers, and the rational numbers form a field, and you can do all sorts of typical kinds of algebra things with them. And you can also reduce any fraction as far as possible so that without loss of generality, WLOG means without loss of generality, uh, 
A over B is reduced as far as possible. A quick way to say that is the greatest common divisor of A and B is 1. Another way to say that is so uh, the prime factorizations um, have distinct primes in them. A and B, A and B have no prime factors in common. And that turns out to be an important assumption. Okay, it's an assumption that is going to definitely help us finish the proof. And it is definitely an assumption you can make without less of generality. Go ahead and assume you have reduced the fraction as far as possible. Okay, so once again, maybe you get to this point and you're like, okay, I, I, I can say this. Now what do you do? It's still not real clear, perhaps. Um, then you remember that x is supposed to be the square root of n, so if I square it, I should get n. I could say then n is x squared is a over b quantity squared, and I assume I know how to do arithmetic with, with rational numbers, that a over b squared would be a squared over b squared. And that means I could, you know, multiply both sides by b squared. I could say that n times b squared is the same as x squared times b squared equals a squared. Okay, that's definitely something that you can write down. And, and you start to feel a little good about yourself. You're saying, hmm, I, I guess I'm writing down some equations that would have to be true and I can make any assumptions that I can make. But still, it's, it's maybe not real clear what to do at this point. And maybe this is the point where you feel really stuck. What do I do from here? Well, in these kinds of proofs, um, it's common to use unique factorization by primes um, or prime factorizations if you've got particular ends here, like 2 or, or 3 or 6, etc. Uh, if I use the unique factorization by primes, what I'm really using is something called the Fundamental Theorem of Arithmetic. I'm just going to abbreviate that FTA, Fundamental Theorem of Arithmetic. It's essentially unique prime factorization. I can say that n can be factored uniquely as products of powers of distinct primes where it's unique up to changing the order of the factors. I could say n is, say, p1 to the k1 power times p2 to the k2 power times p3 to the k3 power, etc. up through some other last prime, call it pm to the km power. I can assume these primes are all increasing in value. I can I do want to assume they're all distinct. The PIs are distinct. And the KIs, the powers, should all be greater than or equal to 1. They are whole numbers, positive integers. They are all greater than or equal to 1, because if they were 0, for example, then I wouldn't bother writing them. I wouldn't bother writing that particular prime to a 0 power, since that would just be 1. So they're all distinct, and the ki's are positive, greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so that's good. Is it helpful? What have we not used yet? Sometimes you're doing a proof and you're stuck, but you haven't used a fact yet. Yeah, I have not used the, the assumption that n is not a perfect square. How could I use that here? Well, if you think about it and maybe consider some examples, you hopefully would eventually realize that that means that at least one of these k's must be odd. Because if they were all even, n would actually be a perfect square. For example, if n happened to be p1 to the 4th times p2 to the 10th power, that is a perfect square. It's the same as p1 squared times p2 to the 5th quantity squared. So at least one of these k's must be odd. More than one could be odd, but at least one of them must be odd. So n not a perfect square, that's my abbreviation here, means there exists, backwards capital E is common mathematical shorthand for it, there exists a, um, call it m, oh, excuse, let's call it j, between 1 and m such that, st stands for such that, k sub j is odd. That's 
what the assumption n is not a perfect square leads to in this situation. Okay, so once again, you say something, you feel good about it, but you still feel stuck. And maybe this is the point where you feel really stuck, and maybe it takes you hours to get past this point, or days, or months. How do you get past this point? Uh, we're going to use this equation now as well here. What do we have? We have n, or let's re rewrite the equation, a squared equals n times b squared, where n is this product of powers of primes that are distinct here. So, in particular, p sub j, that's got a power that's odd, is a divisor of the left side, and therefore is also a divisor of the right side, so therefore is also a divisor of the left side, p sub j uh, divides a squared, another way to say that is that uh, p sub j is a factor of a square, squared. Now if you've got a prime that's a, pow that's a factor of a, a number, a square of the number in particular, it's also going to divide the number itself. pj divides a. Again, another way to say this is that pj is a factor of a squared, pj is a factor of a. And in fact, since pj divides a, in fact, uh, pj squared would divide a squared as well. That's something else I could write down. Um, that means, in fact, a squared actually has an even power of pj. in um, its prime factorization. And that would hold whether or not A itself having PJ, having either an even or odd power in its prime factorization, it would mean P A squared has an even power of PJ in its prime factorization. So is this helpful? Yes, it is. Think about this equation. N, in its prime factorization, has pj to an odd power. A squared has pj to an even power. Therefore, b squared is going to have to have pj to a certain power in its prime factorization, and therefore b itself would have to have pj as a factor in its prime factorization, which is going to contradict this fact up here that I could definitely assume without loss of generality. So a squared has an even power of pj in its prime factorization. This equation is going to now combine to say that uh, b squared has, well, let's say pj divides, divides b squared. b squared has pj in its prime factorization. You could also say, therefore, pj divides b. And in fact, you could also say b squared has an even power of pj in its prime factorization. And I mean, when I say it has an even power, I mean that the that is the highest power of pj in its prime factorization. Because you'd have to add the exponents here. Um, well, another thing you could say is you'd have to add the exponents here to get the correct exponent for a squared, the correct exponents of pj. But I didn't even need to say this last part because the fact that pj divides a and pj divides b, that's enough to get a contradiction. That's getting you a contradiction. When you get a contradiction in math, you often write that symbol there. Now, when my teachers wrote that symbol in the past, when they were teaching me how to do contradiction proofs, I thought it was a star, but actually it's two arrows pointing at each other. That's a contradiction. It's contradicting. This contradicts the fact that the GCD of A and B is one that also A and B had no prime factors in common. PJ divides both of them. PJ is a factor of both of them. And that contradiction can mean only one, one thing. It means your original assumption must be wrong because that assumption led to this logical contradiction. So that assumption must be wrong.
Therefore, x must not be a rational number. Three dots like this means therefore. Therefore, the original, I'm writing more than you might need to, the original assumption is false. So x must not be an element of the set of rational numbers. x must be what we say is an irrational number. And that ends my first proof in my series on real analysis proofs.